Hey everybody, today I want to talk about top bar hives, specifically the pros and cons to uh, why I like them, why I still keep them, even though I keep Langstroth hives too. Uh, in the future I want to do something very similar for the Langstroth hives and just to kind of go over, kind of help newer beekeepers or you know beekeepers that have been around for a while or maybe people getting into beekeeping, uh, why I choose these specific hive types. So with that said, I also want to mention if you want a good balance between a top bar hive and a Langstroth hive, there's a hive called the, uh, I've heard it called Langstroth Long and also a horizontal hive. So basically it uses the frames from a Langstroth hive while being in the style of a top bar hive where it's long. Benefit to that is you don't have to do a lot of lifting, you know, the Langstroth hives they stack and sometimes the honey on top, one of those boxes will be, could be 70 pounds, so it's hard to unstack those. With the long hives, you're only dealing with one frame at a time, so it's, it's beneficial. There is somebody who's been encouraging me, another YouTuber, uh, basically in my, my whole YouTube journey I've been doing over the past few months, um, and he builds these things and he does a great job doing it. His name's Ricky Rourke. I'm going to add a link to uh, one of his videos down below and I hope you guys enjoyed if you uh, like his stuff uh, subscribe subscribing and liking videos is a lot of encouragement for us uh, youtubers so uh, I always appreciate you guys doing it for me and especially these other guys who really encouraged me along the way and I thank you all for encouraging me also so let's start talking about these top bars all right so I've shown in videos in the past how I build these top bars they are pretty simple to build the only one measurement you really need to worry about is the bar size because that's what determines how far apart they build the combs, which you'll see that in a little, little bit. So the, the measurements and everything, and there's a bunch of schematics you can pull up online and to help you see how to build these. You can really decorate them. You can leave them plain as I do it, and I do them very plain and very simple and very uh, cost effective is a lot of my goal. So. Uh, you can see that they're long. Benefits to this is that you don't have to do a lot of lifting. Like I mentioned, the Langstroth hives stack up as you get more and more honey. These hives aren't meant to do that. They're meant to be completely contained in this one box here. Uh, with that being said, you don't, like I said, you don't have to do a lot of lifting. Uh, it's easier for people with bad backs or that struggle lifting 70 pounds right here and putting it on the ground. So these are very popular for backyard beekeepers. Some people say it's not good to start with a top bar, but that's how I started. And I, I enjoyed it since the beginning. I just, I love how these, uh, these hives are, are built and put together. Downfall to this is it is stationary. It's not very easy to move. It depends on how long and how big you build it, of course. These are about 33 inches long. They are very heavy, especially filled with bees. They're not easy to move versus a Langstroth where you can kind of take it apart in pieces and move it. So that's something to keep uh, in consideration wherever you find these hives or wherever you want these hives, put them, let the bees go in them and that's probably where they're gonna stay. You can't really do a lot of, some people do pollination services. It's not advised with these top bars because, which you'll see in a little bit, there's no support for the combs. So as they get rattled around, if it's a uh, honeycomb, honey's really heavy and there's no support except for on the top bar. So if they get rattled around, they could break and that comb's gonna fall and make a mess and the bees aren't gonna be happy and you're gonna have to fix it and you're not gonna be happy, it's, it's just a mess. So again, uh, put these somewhere and leave them and just enjoy them where they're at. All right, so I'm gonna try to get you a view kind of how I see it. So here's the lid. The lid basically keeps it waterproof because once you get down to these top bars, they're kind of like what you're gonna find. I've actually found a couple scorpions in here just because I'm in a piney environment. So, I've, I've, and that's only been at the new place. Never had that before. So I keep an eye on it. Uh, I mentioned comb breaking. So if any of those comb break, I usually keep a few of these rescue bars around. So you'll see the comb it attaches to the top. If any of that ever breaks off, I can pick that comb up that's broken off and push it back on here and put it in and the bees will repair it. That's what I did. I used some of those for that cutout that I did in the mailbox. All right, so I usually start at the back.
and <laughs> this one swarmed the, um, a couple weeks ago and it looks like the population is already a good size. So you see this one, that's that bar that I mentioned. So I use these starter strips, it's just a little piece of wood and the bees will build wax straight from there. And whenever you get honey, whenever there's honey on it, you just take a knife, take a bucket, brush off all the bees and cut it down and just drop it in a bucket and you do a crush and strain method. That is, uh, it's a little bit more, um, I guess another downfall to a top bar is you usually won't have the ability to extract the honey uh, through like putting the comb in and spinning it out like you would a traditional length trough frame. Usually there's a crush and strain method unless you wanna develop some kind of specialized tool that you can use. Another issue I wanna show, and there's some going on in this one, and I've learned not to be worried about this with a top bar hive, is called cross combing. So basically what happens is the bees will start building fat comb towards the back where there's honey, because honey's always a little bit fatter. So if you can see this pokes out some, and they've actually started to attach it to the next bar. This problem can get really out of hand. And a lot of people, you know, when you mention a top bar, they talk about cross combing. To me, it's really not that much of an issue. So I'll pull this one out. Now, like I said, you can see that it's um, just a, a little bit cross combed right now. And sometimes there'll be four or five of these bars stuck together and it'll progressively get worse. And you can see that is honey coming out from there. Honey on that side and over here they already got some cap stuff which is good. They got some, a lot of these are drones actually back here. Like that guy, that guy, that guy. And they are freeloading. All of those are drones. So I'm surprised that there's actually this much uh, honey storage going on. Because one, like I said, this hive is swarmed already. And two, because um, in this area where I'm at, there's a lot of goldberry honey. That's like what this area is known for is the goldberry. And they haven't started blooming yet. Usually they should be coming up pretty quick. Usually it's a May and June thing and these hives will be packed with honey and that's what I'm excited about. Now if you see, this is more capped honey. And this right now is edible, right? Uh, and storable, I guess that's the main thing. Um, and that is a lot. So they're doing a really good job. Now let's get back to the cross combing thing. Now as if they continue to cross comb and it gets worse and worse and worse, it's a simple fix for me. All I do is make sure it's not attached to the side. So if it is, I take my knife and I just cut all the way down, slice all the way down the sides. And then if there's three or four stuck together, I'll move them back as a whole unit. And up here, I'll just put in empty bars and I'll do that in between straight combs. So they'll keep building straight, straight, and I continue to move that back. Every time I work it, I'll put some, you know, just one of these empty bars in between two full combs and the, that eventually straightens it out. Now this cross comb stuff, we're still left with that, but perfect. It's filled up with honey. So honey collection time, I put it over a bucket, try to get as many of the bees off as I can, chop it into the bucket, and then I don't care if it's cross combed or not. And then I have these empty bars that I'm left with and I can put these back up front. So it's a continuous cycle. Another advantage of these top bars is that we can uh, continually cycle through fresh, clean comb. And we're not getting comb that's been uh, stored up over time that eventually gets chemicals and everything leaked into it. All right, you can see this one's a straight one. This is what we want. So. What you could do is between these two straight ones, you know, there's no cross combing, you just put an empty one and then they build the comb there. They can't cross comb it because they're wedged in between the two combs already. Now this hive is very full. I don't really want to split this hive because they're in production mode and I want them to make, I want them to fill this hive up with honey. That is my goal. All right. So up here, you can see you got the capped honey at the top and then you got all the nectar uh, down below that, that dark nectar that they're, they're covering up. So what makes, I guess this is bonus information, 
What makes honey a specific kind of honey, like I mentioned gallberry earlier, is that's the nectar they produce. So when bees bring in nectar, it generally has like um, 70 or 80 percent water content. And what they do over time is they fan it and they dehydrate it and they get that nectar down to uh, about a 17 to 19 percent water content and that's when they can cap it and that's honey. So basically it's just nectar that's been ultra dehydrated. Okay. All right. So with the top bars also, when we're holding them, we can be up and down like this, up and down like this, even to the side, to that side, however like that. What we can never do is take this and do this. Because once we do that, once we put this comb this way, there's no support because there's no foundation, so it's gonna break. And that's when we're gonna be using these rescue bars. So we're just gonna be able to push that right back on. Now, if it has nectar or honey in it, I'm gonna push this guy out, wrong way, you get up. So if there's nectar or honey on that, uh, on that comb, it's, you're not gonna be able to get it to stick that because nectar and honey is so heavy, it's just gonna break that wax and fall through those wires. All right. So we're going up and you see we've gotten into brood. So another thing about these top bar hives, and again, this warmed a while back. So you can see that there is a lot of brood and again, the older stuff is in the middle. And as you can see, as it goes outer, you have younger and younger stuff. This is a really good comb. I mean, I can see, I don't know if you can see, there's brood in almost, you know, varying ages of brood in almost all of those cells. Same thing on this side. That is a good queen and she is brand new. She'll be good for a couple years. So next year, I'm definitely gonna try to get ahead of things and not let this hive swarm because I know that queen is gonna be good. So, but with that brood, so the queen has a brood area, just like in uh, a Langstroth hive. So inside that brood area, that's where the eggs are laid, that's where the nurse bees raise the, the larva and everything. And that is um, essentially, like I said, where, the, where, the, where the, the young bees are raised. This is heavy. Okay. So she normally will not want to go past honey. Now I say that, like this one had a lot of brood in it. And so I'm looking at these. Right. And now all of a sudden this one has honey in it. So honey, honey on each side. And you're like, man, that's, that's, that's crazy. You know, what happened? She's supposedly once there's honey made, she does not want to cross that honey and lay any eggs, but there's clear evidence that she did. So I think what we're going to see is this, which is good. Look at that pattern. That is pattern of a great queen. And like I said, she is new. She is new. And that is just a great pattern. And I'm pretty sure those ones that have holes in it are probably emerged. And I'm looking for, for emerging brood now to see if that's the case. You see these bees kind of going back in and cleaning cells out. That's a good, that's a really good pattern. Now what I'm gonna have to do is I'm seeing this, um, a little bit of an issue. So in the meantime, while the queen, and here we have honey too. So while the queen was getting ready to start laying, I think the other bees have started to fill this up with honey. So what I'm going to end up doing is checkerboarding several of these because I want her to stay up here. I want to have a couple bars of honey back here stopping her from wanting to lay eggs back because back here I just want honey. That way any of those bars are just full honey and there's no brood in them so I can chop them and uh, chop, drop, and crush and strain. Here's another pattern. You can see it is just jam full. I want to emphasize that she is a new queen. This is a vigorous laying queen. 
good. All of that is brewed. See the difference in honey, where it's that translucent color, and brewed, where it's that really dark brown color? And this is all worker brewed. Drone brewed has a raised up cap. It almost looks like a tiny little, um, just a little bit of a rounded part versus it being flat. So another benefit to top bar hives is you can see the bees build all natural comb. And so the argument has been the bees can build whatever size they say they want to in nature. If you use a foundation, the foundation has pre-printed um, pre uh, cell shapes on it. So it's telling those bees to build that cell however it is, it's shaped. So with this top bar, just give them the freedom to build however they want to. And so the argument is, is that bees typically like smaller cells because when they came out of foundation, the foundation was kind of to encourage larger cells. So when they started storing honey, when they started storing honey, the, uh, they would have bigger cells to store the honey in. Now, the problem with bigger cells is that you have uh, mites, the varroa mites, that their life cycle is to lay the eggs inside of big cells. That's why they love drones. See that drone, how much bigger he is than the worker? The drone cells are much bigger. So they're more likely to have varroa mites in those cells. Now with these smaller cells where the bees build them themselves, the varroa mite can't, um, well the argument is, uh, basically it gets crowded out. So it's more uncomfortable for the varroa mite. There won't be as many mites. And this is just a natural way to uh, fight against mites is have these smaller cell sizes. And I want to point out here, you see one of my old, old style V's, um, similar to this one fell and it fell in the hive. So what I did is I used a rescue bar like this and I just pushed it right back on. And you can see there's the metal wires and they just reattached it all. So it's, it's attached pretty well. All right. And like I said, this queen is just a laying machine. So once all of these come out, <laughs> there is going to be a huge population of bees and I'm probably going to end up splitting them, uh, probably closer to the end of, I'll probably do a honey pool. Um, Let's see, it's, it's very end of April now. I'll probably do a honey pool um, end of May, and then I'll go ahead and split. So that way they have enough time to make a new queen before the dearth hits and they throw all the drones out. But I will definitely leave that queen here. And so sometimes you wanna make sure that you find the queen, but sometimes when you see evidence of a laying queen like this, it is not that big of a deal not to find her because you know she is doing her job. And there's no queen cells where, you know, they may have swarmed. So, um, like I'm not concerned with not finding the queen. Oh, actually there she is. So she's right there. She's actually looking on this <laughs> where they've already, so the beginning, the front of the, the hives is where they usually, they come in and they do all the temporary like nectar and pollen stores. It's like I said, it's right in the front. And she's actually on this uh, comb uh, looking for a place to lay because she is out of places. So what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna put this one back because I found her. Again, make sure she's down here so I'm not squishing her between the bars. I'm going to give them an empty bar here. And I'm gonna go a few. And I'm gonna give them this halfway put together bar, right? They'll straighten it out. If I can make some room. This gets very heavy. Let me start trying to do it like this. And again, I like to, as I put them back, 
I like to go ahead and put them side by side instead of having them all spread apart a little bit because what the bees do is they start getting in between and on the boards and I just don't want at the end it to be like a big struggle trying to get all these bars put back without squishing the bees. So I put them together several at a time, kind of shimmy them in to give the bees the time to move out of the way. So I'll check her board this one. And I'm gonna, they're almost to the back. So I am going to checkerboard them again. Now this hive, even though it was just split, this has a tendency already to swarm because it is so packed with, uh, and the queen's running out of room because she's such a crazy layer. So having a good laying queen isn't necessarily an issue until she runs out of room. And I don't mind that. I just don't want to lose the productivity by having them swarm. And plus, like I mentioned in other videos, I don't want them swarming and moving into somebody's house. Cutouts are nice, but uh, they're not so nice when you're having to pay for it. All right, so I got another empty one. These get a little tight, so I'm gonna put it right back down there. And now they have a few that are empty. Now, when the bees sense this in the brood chamber, they like to be close together. So they like all those combs stacked after another. So they'll actually probably come here, the wax builders, and start building this out before they continue to build wax here because they want that brood chamber to be continuous. So right here, we're forcing that behavior, trying to get them to build, build, build. So that's the idea of checkerboarding. That's the technical name for this. All right, so that's what I have for today. Uh, trying to make these videos a little bit shorter. I try not to get as wordy, but I know that was still extremely wordy. So uh, I'm just gonna end it. But before I do, like I said, some upcoming things. Um, still waiting 250 subscribers and I'll give that nuke away. I have a few really good ones going and I just didn't made another split. Uh, so I will give the, that away. Um, also remember to check out my friend Ricky Rourke's channel. It's, it's really good. And uh, just if you ha guys have any questions about top bars or any other beekeeping questions, let me know. If you have anything that, you know, any advice for me with top bars, let me know. Because I always want to learn, always want to do a little bit better and build this beekeeping community up. So hope you all have a great day. Love you all. If you haven't subscribed, please click that. Um, again, thank you all so much for watching.